Hello folks. Today I gave a vector tiles talk, just a brief talk, at the Charlotte Metropolitan GIS User Group, or CMGUG, if you're into abbreviations. And I'm just going to do it again here. I do this for a lot of my talks because my slides are almost entirely without utility. This is probably the most useful thing in my slides you're looking at right now. So I just do these again on YouTube so people can actually hear what I said and hopefully it will have some more use. GIS people are very, we're very excitable. We get excited over the tiniest things. There's always something new and shiny and titillating right over the horizon. And then it comes over the horizon and gets into our hands and we find out it is not very new and it is not very titillating. It's just a slight variation on stuff we've been doing for thousands of years. Vector tiles are an exception in my opinion. If anything, I don't think they've gotten enough attention yet. Vector tiles not only let us do what we're already doing much, much, much better, we can do lots of things we just couldn't do before with vector tiles. So in this talk, we'll go over a little bit about map caches and vector tiles and how to make them and serve them and consume them and some kinds of things that are coming in the future. Before we get into that, in case you don't have the misfortune of dealing with uh, map tiles for a living, in the beginning, this was a millennia ago, back in like the 1990s, when you requested a map from a server, it made that map right then and there. You'd say, I need a map that's so tall and so wide with this stuff in it, and the server would have to do it on the spot. And that's fine, but that's a lot of work for a server to have to do. It would have to go fetch all of your data. It would have to apply all your crazy styling rules and all your crazy labeling rules. Export that out to an image and send that back to the client. It's a lot of work. And if you got any kind of traffic at all, pretty soon your server would just turn into a furious ball of nothing. And even if it kept running, it would be slow. And slow on the web is terrible. So the thing to do was to make a cache, a server side map cache. Cache just means you're kind of putting a little pocket there and you're stuffing into that pocket all that work that was being done and you're doing it ahead of time. So when somebody requests stuff, you have it all ready for them and can be very fast and it can be very untaxing for the server to do that. The obvious problem there is you can't exactly cache an image of a, a street level image, say around zoom level 15 of the world, that image would have enough pixels to go between here and Pluto and back, Pluto being a planet, I don't care what they say, and that's never getting to a web browser. So you have to chop that sucker up. You chop it into little squares, and those little squares are called tiles. And that's your tiled map cache. And as part of that, to keep, make everything, you know, work with everything else, came up with a sort of shared, kicking and screaming, a shared map projection and defined zoom levels and assigned grids. So zoom level zero is the whole world fits onto one tile. Zoom level 20 is very zoomed in right into your personal space. And that's how that works. Up until now, that's almost always been image tiles, PNGs. And that's fine, but there's three big problems with image map caches. The first being that is that images don't really scale. You take that image, you try to make it bigger, it gets pixelated. You try to make it smaller, it gets blurry. Because of that, you have to generate images for every single zoom level you support. And you don't really support zoom levels in between those. If you want, I want kind of zoom level 17 and a half, well, tough nuts. You can't have that. That's going to be blurry or it's going to be pixelated. Second problem is image caches are fairly immutable. They're not changeable. 
And that's a big problem because no 2GS people agree about anything, particularly when it comes to map styling. You make these beautiful base, base map, and the person next to you go, you know, I really want my buildings to be kind of mauve. And then the person on the other side goes, you know, I really want them to be green. And then the other person says, you know, for my story map, which totally is not really a thing, my story map doesn't want buildings at all because it would interfere with my story, which again isn't really a thing. With raster tiles, you have to build a separate tile cache for every single one of those people. And then you have to maintain that, and it's a huge amount of storage space, it's a huge amount of server overhead and time. It's just terrible. The third problem is, of course, these images are just images. They don't really know anything. They don't know if they're a lolcat or a contour map. They have no earthly idea. So you can't do anything very interesting and GIS-y with it. Vector tiles solve all of these problems. A vector is scales perfectly. That same line will draw perfectly whether you're at zoom level 0 or zoom level 20. That means you only have to build tiles to the level of detail in your data, generally never more than zoom level 14. That saves untold number of tiles, untold amount of processing time, untold amount of space. They're also styled in the client, so they are immensely changeable. That person that wanted mauve tiles, mauve buildings or green buildings or no buildings, they can all be served from the same set of tiles. No problem. Finally, because these are vectors and they have information attached to them or can, you can do real GIS-y kind of stuff with this data. That's what's awesome about vector tiles. Now, all this is great, but we needed three things to happen to be, really be able to use any of this. First, you got WebGL. WebGL is a JavaScript API for doing 2D and 3D animation and physics modeling in your browser with no plugins. And that's what you need to render these vectors, rendering them as an SVG or even in Canvas are too slow. WebGL renders, uh, it interacts directly with the GPU, makes it extremely fast and smooth. Second thing we needed is a good, no, a, a great vector tile standard and tool set. And that's what Mapbox has given us. Mapbox vector tile uh, specification is great. The way they encode it in Protobuf makes it extremely small, machine, extremely fast for machines to deal with. They made Mapbox GLJS to uh, render and style all this stuff. Mapbox, in my opinion, is probably the most disruptive company GIS has seen in the last 20 years or so. They did all that and it's all open source. So now we have the rendering engine and we have the tools. But we needed one more thing. To use WebGL, you have to have a browser that supports WebGL. You may have noticed your IT shop mysteriously upgraded everyone from Internet Explorer 9 to 11 this year. And you probably thought to yourself, a web browser that's less than a decade old? This doesn't sound like my IoT shop. You can thank Microsoft for that. Microsoft got fed up with your IT shop and said, okay, in January of 2016, we are going to stop supporting any version of Internet Explorer that isn't the most current in that operating system, which for almost everyone is IE11. And it, that support includes security patches. So all these folks, governments and businesses won't have that were squatting on IE9 had to upgrade. Now that we're on Internet Explorer 11, Internet Explorer 11 supports WebGL, and now all of our browsers can do all this great stuff. So you can leverage vector tiles now and do amazing things. This is just a few numbers on vector tiles just to show you some of the amazing stuff. Mecklenburg County is raster tiles down to zoom level 20 is about 12 gig. That's bigger than the entire United States as vector tiles. Mecklenburg County by itself and just the surrounding counties as well as vectors is about 90 megabytes. 
90 megabytes. I don't know how many times 12 is more than 90. There's probably some math there that could tell us that, but it's a lot. It's so much smaller and easier to work with, and they're very quick to make. Mecklenburg's parcels and buildings render to vector tiles in about 15 seconds, and it's less than nine megabytes. Now, we have a site called GeoPortal that's our first one to use vector tiles. Uh, we'll go in here. Go back to full screen. I've actually was messing with this before. We'll go back to streets. We'll unpitch it. This is all vector tiles. See, it all renders nice and pretty. If I didn't tell you vector tiles, you probably wouldn't know unless you started fiddling with it. All of this is rendered and styled in the browser. Notice with these labels, we can spin the map around, which you can do with a vector tile very easily. See the labels turn. It's because they're all rendered in the browser. You can see stuff like this along a street will reorient itself correctly as that goes past vertical there. You can also do stuff like pitch the map, give it kind of a 3D-ish sort of look, 3D, 2.5D, whatever D you're comfortable with. And since this is all styled in the browser, we did an April Fool's joke, said we, we decided we're going back to blueprints and made a blueprint style. And this is all done with the exact same base map tiles. We're just changing the style of it. And vector tiles lets you do that. Now all GeoPortal is really doing here is cartography in terms of vector tiles. For the most part, we're tilting and pitching just because it's that's kind of neat. But you can do all kinds of really interesting things with, with vector tiles. A lot of these samples I'm showing you are coming straight from the Mapbox GLJS examples. You should definitely check out their website when you start looking at the stuff. The documentation is fantastic. So this looks like a regular map. We click anywhere in here, we can see what that stuff is. See, there's some water, there's some scrubland, there's some grass. There's some admin level four disputed zero. I don't even know what that is. There's just all this stuff because these are all vectors and there's data behind them. Data we can see and query and manipulate. Did you see how fast those polygons just rendered? That was over 3000 polygons. Every county and county like thing in the United States, over 3000. Imagine, I mean, when you get to like 500 just points, when you're rendering on, say, a traditional non-WebGL, non-Canvas type surface, you really start to hit performance problems. 3,000 polygons here, no problem. And because these are vector tiles, it has data behind them. We can hover over this county and see all the other counties with that same name and the total population in all of those counties that have the same name just like that on the fly through these vector tiles. Here's another example. You see we have a fairly bland map. We can change style format, change the style of the tiles directly in the browser. We can make them a nice blue. We can pick out the buildings, make them an ugly red. And pretty soon you have a tremendously ugly map. But the point is, you can do all that right in the browser. You didn't have to make a whole new set of base tiles for that. Now here we can see, actually I need to cheat a little bit with this. There's a bug in version 18, Backmark GLGS, on some platforms. Uh, it will be fixed in 19. I say that with some confidence because I'm the one that fixed it. All right. We're changing the language of these country names because in OpenStreetMap, features can have a label in more than one language. So these labels are rendering on the fly in the browser. We're going to have to fix this version 18 thing again here. Hopefully it will still work. Yep. 
Now this is really awesome and it's easy to miss how awesome it is. This pink area is a vector tile from a separate source. Actually, I think it might just be GeoJSON. And it is the urban area or built out area or you know something like that. But what's really cool here is notice where it is. Because our base map is vector tiles, we can slip that overlay layer right in the middle of the stack somewhere. Here we're slipping it right bit before it draws the water. Now think about when you make a choropleth map right now. You make that map and you stick it on top of your base map and you immediately have a huge problem. If you make the choropleth polygons opaque enough that you can really see the colors of them, you can't see below them to the base map to orient yourself. If you can see through them to see the base map to orient yourself, you can't really make out the colors. And then you end up with just stupid stuff like an opacity slider that nobody knows how to use. So you've got a map that's optimized for really nobody in the world. With the vector tiles, you can slip that choropleth map right in the middle of your stack and have the roads sit right on top of it. That way people can orient themselves and see the choropleth at the same time. That is really, really cool. Now this is uh, a different demo that I saw at Phosphor-G. Uh, this is really cool. This is, these are just squares with values. This is uh, OpenStreetMap Road Density, I believe. We can just draw a polygon on here. And you can see it has, now it has a road density and a total road length. It's using turf and some other tools to do area reaggregation on the fly. It's doing a area weighted sum and mean based on say you've got half of this square and 20% of that square and 40% of that square. It's accurately counting all that stuff and re-aggregating right in the browser. So the vectors, you can do real GIS work right in a browser. Like I went to school kind of GIS work. And that is super cool. Those are just a few samples of the things you can do with vector tiles. It's really just a whole world starting to blossom there. And you're gonna see some really, really neat stuff in vector tiles in the near future. Now creating vector tiles, first thing I'd say is I probably wouldn't make a whole base map if you can avoid it. Open street map data is probably better than your data, at least for cartographic purposes. I switched GeoPortal, which services like eh, 18 to 20,000 people a month to OpenStreetMap and no one noticed. I noticed because I noticed all of the overpasses and everything were actually correct. And it had a whole bunch of data we just don't have in our base maps. So I would use OpenStreetMap data. There is a great project called OpenStreetMap to Vector, OSM to Vector Tiles that have made OpenStreetMap data into vector tiles you can just download and use. You can also use services like Mapbox, which are great. To make your own data into vector tiles, the tool to, I would recommend is something called Tippy Canoe. And it's a command line tool. It only runs on Unixy type environments, Linux and Mac, but it's just amazing. That's the thing that can turn our half a million buildings and 300,000 parcels into vector tiles in about 15 seconds. It's really good. You can also make vector tiles live. You can do all kinds of stuff. I kind of rolled my own a PG vector tile server, which you can go see that project. Uh, there's lots of different ones like that. And a lot of the mainstream tooling is getting Mapbox, Mapbox vector tile support like ArcGIS 10.4. GeoServer has a GS-MVT extension you can use to make vector tiles from a WMS request. There's lots of different ways to make vector tiles now. Serving vector tiles, there's lots of ways to do that too. I use about a 40 to 50 line node script that I forked from Chris Helms server 
and it just serves out vector or raster tiles. It's running on a $5 a month DigitalOcean droplet and serving out tiles to, with all the different apps, maybe 25,000 people a month are using this service. And it never blinks, I've never had a single problem. We've been conditioned as GIS people, I think, especially in the non-open source world, to, when we think server GIS stuff, you immediately whip out the checkbook that has the like six figure checks in it. You don't need huge hardware and super expensive software to do things like vector tiles. You can do it very simply and very cheaply, and it will perform better and be more reliable than those very complex solutions. Now this is my uh, 512 megabyte DigitalOcean droplet running our vector tiles and a whole bunch of other stuff. During prime time, you see that CPU meter barely registers. It could handle probably a factor of 100 times the traffic it's getting now. This is easy stuff to do and it's not expensive. Consuming vector tiles. You probably want to use Mapbox GLJS. You can use vector tiles and other stuff like Open Layers 3. Leaflet has a extension that can do Mapbox vector tiles, but it's going to render slower. It's going to render in Canvas instead of WebGL, and it is going to not have... The big thing they don't have generally is the labeling engine, because that's very hard to do. Labeling like along streets and so forth and collision detection and that kind of stuff. But Mapbox GLJS is really the best in class there, and it's what ESRI is going to be using as well. Now, styling is client dependent. So whatever client you use, you would style the data differently depending on that client. Mapbox GLJS has their own kind of JSON style spec that is fairly intuitive and easy to work with. You can also go to Mapbox's uh, Mapbox Studio and have a visual editor for that. Do be aware that Mapbox's OpenStreetMap tiles and OSM to Vector Tiles tiles are slightly different, so you may have to tweak if you're going from one to the other. Mapbox uh, Vector Tiles and Mapbox GLJS and Vector Tiles in general are really in their infancy. They're just changing tremendously quickly. The spec and the libraries are getting improvements all the time. We're in version 0.18.0. 0.19.0 has got a new change in it using uh, Ear Cutter, I believe is the name of the utility that makes it even smoother and faster. You're going to see a lot more third party implementations. There's a 3D tile specification that the folks at Cesium are working on. If you never worked with Cesium, it is a really cool 3D and 2.5D and that kind of side thing they do. Whatever D you're comfortable with saying. Uh, engine for doing 3D visualization, it is just the tool to go use. They're making a 3D vector tile specification for it. And as we get more and more vector tiles, with things like TurfJS and related tools, we're going to have real honest to goodness GIS work being done in the browser itself. And that is really cool. And that was the talk. And there's where the slides are. Mostly if you just want to grab these animated GIFs. You know, goodness knows I stole them from someone else. Now, Fuzzy Tolerance is, of course, the blog where I blog out some of this stuff and Twitter handle. This is my GitHub account that has all of our GitHub repos. There's several I've got out there now dealing, several different tools dealing just with vector tiles. Said you're all MIT licensed. Please use them. Do whatever you like with them. All right, folks, that was that talk. And I can't think of anything else I want to tell you other than enjoy vector tiles. It is just a really big and cool thing that is coming down the pipe for us. And it's, I'm more excited about vector tiles than I've been about a, any other change I've seen in the last five years or so. So it's really cool stuff, and it's very easy to get into. Hope you enjoyed that. Bye-bye.